Okay, so welcome everybody. We've got about uh, 26 partic uh, participants so far um, joining us and I'm sure there'll be more along the way. Um, my name is Beth Dickens and I am from Blue Hill Heritage Trust. I am the administrative coordinator there and I am very happy to welcome everybody to the Friends in the Field webinar for this evening. Uh, we've, uh, we were talking earlier and we, we're not sure what number this is, but we've been doing this for a while. This is a collaboration between Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust. And if you are joining us for the first time and you're unfamiliar with either one of our organizations, we welcome you to um, afterwards take a look on the internet at our website so that you can find out more of what we do in the area um, and the ways that we serve our communities. Um, I'm gonna have uh, Jake do a little bit of housekeeping here and then we will get started. So Jake, take it away. Thank you, Beth. And on behalf of everybody from Island Heritage Trust, thank you for participating today. We're so excited to be a part of this collaborative webinar series with Blue Hill Heritage Trust. Uh, we will be using the chat box, at, mostly at the end, but feel free to drop a couple of questions to our wonderful panelists throughout the presentation. Uh, Beth and I will kind of take turns going back and forth, um, go, stewarding the questions at the end, and we'll try to save the best we can, like somewhere around 10 minutes for questions. Uh, the other feature you can use if you choose is the raise your hand feature, and that is at the bottom center right of your screen, and you can raise your hand, and then that will give Beth the option to open up your audio, and you can ask our panelists your question yourself. And with that, I'm gonna introduce formally our three wonderful presenters this afternoon. We have David Porter here from Brooklyn. He is a resident and retired biology professor from the University of Georgia. And he spent many summer hours poking around the intertidal zone, fascinated by the <laughs> diversity of the seaweed and the intermediate life of the main coast. We have Zach Holbury, from, he is a resident of Penobscot and currently the vice president of the conservation and research chair. At the um, oh, I don't know exactly, maybe. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> okay. I think what might have happened is if, if any of our panelists, let me see here, our um, panelists link, then it brings you right into the video, which is totally fine. Um, but I will just continue introducing Zach. No worries, no harm, no foul. Sorry about that, Zach. Um, <laughs> let me, I'll, I think I know where I, right where I left off. Uh, Zach's background is in wildlife ecology and he did his master's work in water birds, specifically the ecology of the reddish egrets. I think I said that correctly. He has worked in the field seasons through all seasons through the US. Uh, working collaboratively, collecting data on birds and other wildlife alike. And last but certainly not least, we have Zoe Weil. Uh, she is the president of the Institute of Humane Education. When she's not working to transform education and prepare students for solutionaries who are motivated and to build the world where people are and collaboration with the animals, nature, so that animals and nature can thrive. She's usually exploring outdoors, and she particularly has a fondness for the Blue Hill Falls, which is what we're all here to talk about today. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over and let our very knowledgeable presenters talk about the Blue Hill Falls. <laughs> all right, so I start, right? You go, Zach. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to switch from staring at me awkwardly to staring at a present, my presentation on uh, trying to create a sanctuary at Blue Hill Falls, uh, specifically for eiders, but also some of the other unique things there. So here's Blue Hill Falls. If you haven't seen it before, it's a uh, reversing tidal falls. It's located right here in South Blue Hill. Um, so it's unique in that, first of all, it's one of the few reversing falls in Maine. There's about nine that are known in the world, eight of which are in Maine and one up in uh, New Brunswick. You have the Bagadoosh Falls in Brooksville, uh, Blue Hill Falls here, and Goose Falls also in Brooksville. 
And then just a little further up the county, Sullivan Falls, and then a, a couple of smaller ones in Harpswell, Newcastle, and Pescada. So just that alone, that feature is pretty unique in the world. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go back to why now this should we should be protecting the falls. So mussels once covered as much as two thirds of Maine's intertidal zone and now cover less than 15%, probably below 10% now. And some theories as to why that happened. One theory is green crab predation. Another is increase in human harvesting and uh, warm ocean water and mussel disease. I've been leading towards green crab predation since uh, mussel farms seem to be doing all right. And they're harvested on uh, suspended ropes that don't touch the bottom. So if it was mussel disease or warming oceans, you'd also see the effect on those. So I'm thinking as green crab predation, maybe that started in the 90s and they uh, predate mostly on the young mussels. So then we'll see the mussel die off much later when the uh, older mussels uh, age out. So in the last several decades, blue mussels have gone from 60% to less than 10%. Warming waters are, are another sus suspect, um, but one that helps with the green crabs to spread and also it makes the blue mussels less uh, vigorous. So the rapid in decline of mussels most likely led to the rapid decline in eiders. And uh, several years ago, I wrote for Audubon about this, but I graphed the data from all our Christmas bird counts. And you can see the number of eiders. It's bouncing around about 6,000 birds that we counted in our four uh, Christmas bird counts in Hancock County for se several years or decades. Then right here in 2012, you'll see it drop to about you know, 30, 25% of what it was and stay down there. Uh, this is statewide. You can see it same year around 2012, that number's dipping and staying low. Um, so what this led to is a concentration of eiders in places where mussels remain. So, I assume because of the flow at tidal falls, it keeps the green crabs at bay. So these areas like Blue Hill Falls and Sullivan Falls, will see these large concentrations of eiders. This is a picture from Blue Hill Falls showing the common eiders. Um, here we have the number of eiders in Hancock County by the Christmas bird count data. And the blue is eBird data showing the highest amount counted at Blue Hill Falls. These aren't always accurate since people are kind of estimating and it happens which time to go here. So you can see that at Blue Hill Falls, it can be over 50% of the birds are there to you know a third of the birds and all of Hancock County can be found at the falls at one time. So it's a very important resource for eiders in our county. So what happens when they're disturbed? You can see in this picture, and the eiders are disturbed, they're all waterlogged and they start to basically, for lack of a better word, stampede out of the foraging zone and out into the bay. So why disturbance is the issue is disturbance can cause a loss of foraging time. Hunting can cause the eiders to be gone all day or longer. People on the shore can cause eiders to be gone for maybe 20 minutes or hours, depending on the magnitude and duration of disturbance at the shore. So the time when the disturbance is important is when the eiders are here in the winter foraging in large groups, not when they're nesting out in the islands. And you'll see that they're mostly here from about mid-October to the very beginning of April. And after that, they're migrating north or out to offshore islands to do nesting. So this is the time we're concerned about mitigating the effects on the eiders at Blue Hill Falls. So why the Blue Hill Falls should be protected as a wildlife sanctuary is it's unique. It's a biodiversity hotspot. It's a marine refuge, has a concentrated eider population and has rare species. Reversing falls, as we showed before, are a unique habitat found few other places in the world. The high flow of water creates large amounts of food and species diversity, but also limits which species can live there, like potentially the green crabs. 
and acts as almost a natural marine refuge. These factors likely cause the falls to be spared the plight of other marine environments, causing a high concentration of wintering eiders at the falls, and maybe a higher concentration of other species. And as forages decrease in other places, disturbance to this site is more problematic as the food is scarce elsewhere. So rare birds, uh, Barrow's golden eye is one of them, harlequin duck, scoters, purple sandpipers, and king eider. So the Barrow's golden eye, the eastern population, you can see it over here around Maine as the wintering area, Maine and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and the small breeding habitat up in Quebec. There's a total of about 4,000 birds in that whole population, according to the Canadian um, Endangered Species Agency. It's listed as special concern. It's listed as vulnerable in Newfoundland and and Labrador, and also it's listed in Maine as a species of concern. The number of Barrow's golden eyes wintering in all of the Atlantic Canada and Maine rarely exceeds 400 birds. And Maine averages about 33 birds a year. Yeah, so, and the Canadian Wildlife Service determined that even a small continuous harvest could impact the population. And the daily bag limit for golden eyes in Maine is four with no penalty for incidental take of Barrow's golden eyes, which even for birders can be hard to identify, yet alone like flying fast. A sighting of at least 12 Barrow's golden eyes at Salt Pond was recorded just a couple of years ago. And there's also people that noted that there might've been up to 20, which if there's about usually 33 birds in Maine, at Barrow's golden eyes, that's a very high amount. The eastern population of the harlequin duck, you can see most of the harlequin ducks are on the west coast and uh, breed in the mountain streams of the Canadian Rockies, the Rockies, Cascades, and, and the, in Alaska. But some harlequins are found in Quebec and wintering on our shores. They're not commonly seen because they stick to these outer islands and rocky shores on the peninsulas and islands. They can sometimes be found at the falls though, due to the, the rapids causing a habitat that is similar to those rocky shores. So it makes them, uh, it's a more accessible site to see this bird. The scoters, Maine has three scoter species, surf, white winged and black, black not being pictured here. Um, while common on both, co on both coasts, they're usually found far out in the bay, but they can be found near the falls sometimes. Purple sandpipers is another one. It's a common winter resident, but usually found in you know, more turbulent offshore islands and peninsulas, but can be found at the falls. And the king eider, the Eastern population. So most king eiders you'll see are in Alaska, but some of the ones, some king eiders will sometimes occasionally winter in Maine. It's a heavily declining population, the eastern population, and Maine is the only place in the U.S. to consistently have this species outside of Alaska. The species has no protection in Maine, despite there being very few that visit here. Hunters have targeted the species due to its rarity. Um, so there, it's just lumped in with the other eiders, the common eiders, even though it's very rare and there's usually only a couple wintering here in Maine. And as you can see, it doesn't really winter anywhere else in the U.S. outside of Alaska. So the proposed sanctuary would be in, in two different levels, basically. At the red zone, I have no hunting in the red zone from October 15th through April 1st. So this is the zone where the, the basically the view shed of the eiders. They're usually foraging right in this area. Uh, no diving duck hunting in the yellow zone, October 5th to April 1st. So that's to protect um, golden eyes. Both common and Barrow's golden eyes are in here. And to prevent confusion of potentially incidental take of Barrow's golden eyes, which feed in the mussel beds up in the salt pond, it makes sense to just prohibit uh, diving duck hunting for common golden eyes as well. Prohibit commercial harvest within the red zone. Any commercial harvest could change the invertebrate 
insects that live on the bottom that all these eiders are feeding on. And it also, if it was, went through the winter, it would cause a, a daily disturbance to the species. And prohibit prolonged intention, intentional or repetitive disturbance in the feeding ground from October 15th through April 1st. So this wouldn't affect anything during the summertime when the falls gets the most use, but limit things that would keep eiders from um, not being able to forage for long periods of time. Uh, so our, our small committee that has been working on this project is myself, Lita Beth Gray, Tom Bjorkin, Leslie Clapp, and we've been trying to communi communicate with Sarah Plebworth, our representative, to get this proposed as a state wildlife sanctuary. As far as I know, there's never been a wildlife sanctuary that's dedicated to helping wildlife that live and dwell in salt water. They're all land-based at this point. Um, there is one, I think it may be in Mary Meeting Bay, but it wasn't set up, I don't think, to preserve wildlife, but it was more of a privacy access issue. So I'll stop there and uh, answer any questions people have about that. So Zach, we did have one question come up, which was from um, Val Libby, who said, um, I understand that over the past few years, there's been a hunter who has been going there to shoot birds every winter just for fun. And can anyone, um, can anyone add to that? Does anyone, you know, what can anybody do about that? Yeah, so with a sanctuary, designation then that would help prohibit that. I have heard of also maybe a guide from Belfast that brings people from all over the U.S. that sometimes hunts off off there. Um, most of the locals, I've a couple of the locals I've talked to that duck hunt, um, they seem to think it is an understandable idea to set aside that place because right now you can hunt, as far as I know, you can hunt anywhere on the main coast. Um, there is no refuge. Even if, I, even if you wanted to hunt off Acadia National Park, you probably could. Um, or private property, you can go on private shoreline for hunting, fishing, and nav fowling. Fowling, fishing, and navigating. So. so right now we still have laws that cater almost exclusively to the hunting crowd, even though each year um, the birding community in particular and wildlife photography, wildlife watching and bird watching have increased exponentially and the pandemic only made that even higher. So we have a, a few other questions here um, in the chat box at the moment um, pertaining to this. So um, one is from Ann Lusky. Does the commercial uh, prohibition of mussel harvesting prevent individuals from fishing on that land? What do they mean by fishing? What kind of fishing? Are they talking about lobstering? Or are they talking about like fishing I, for mackerel? Uh, you know uh, for about? mussels. Fishing for mussels? Yes. If it's for harvesting mussels. If it was like dragging for mussels, yes. I am wondering if um, she means maybe like people who are doing it not for commercial, but for individual like household purposes. Yeah, I mean, right now we're not doing anything for like individuals, but with the massive muscle die off, I'd really question people's choices of going anywhere where there's still large muscle beds. Um, I'm hoping eventually it'll rebound um, with a lot of invasive species when the species first invades there's a huge decrease in the species that it will prey on. But at, over time, they, there's sometimes a rebound where the species adapts. And those seed, seed banks are probably still there for the mussels in deep water areas, mussel farms and stuff like that. But it could be a long time before the mussel beds recover. Excellent. And then I have one more question here from Linda Washburn. Um, and she said one of your earlier slides um, in 2002, it showed, um, it, she's asked in 2002, why an increase in the eiders then? Do you have any, it, it looked like there was a spike if I remember correctly in your slide yeah. of the eider populations? No data for that. It could just be, have to do maybe with um, ice level one year. I think it pushed out of Canada or something like that. Uh, you never know from year to year what, you, but what you want to look at is the mean 
So if you see those large fluctuations, are they fluctuating around the mean? And you'll notice they're kind of fluctuating at a certain level and then they just drop down, stay consistently low. Um, as far as that spike, it was probably just some kind of um, population dynamic, either about a really good year for food or they got pushed down because of ice or they didn't go as far south. Um, either Any of those could explain that spike. Zach, I have a question. Um, are th do the eiders uh, feed on mussels all year long, or you know they're at the Blue Hill Falls in uh, the winter time? But I think they, ob yeah, they I think obviously so. don't stop eating in the summertime. <laughs> yeah, so in the summertime they're in little different habitats. They're on those offshore islands where they nest, and a lot of them actually move up to the Arctic too. Um, and they feed on lots of different invertebrates, but they are very specialized for mussels. So what the niter can do is it can pick a mussel. It likes the ones below the intertidal zone that have a thinner shell and certain size. And they'll swallow those whole and the gizzard, the muscle in their neck will crush the shell and they'll regurgitate the shell and then just swallow the meat. They have a specific adaption for eating mussels. So do golden eyes do the same thing? You mentioned golden eyes in the salt pond uh, feeding on mussels there. I, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure the golden eyes are actually foraging on some other invertebrates. They tend to like places that have certain flow regimes. So mm -hmm. sometimes where a river enters into either another large river or bay. So I think the flow from the, the reversing falls into the salt pond is making that unique habitat that golden eyes like. Mm -hmm. I don't think they really eat mussels as much, but it has something mm -hmm. to do with, I think, the flow characteristics. They're eating some of these smaller invertebrates that are in the water column or on the floor. But I'm not can exactly- them, Can we teach them to eat green crabs? Yeah. We need to teach ourselves to eat green crabs. <laughs> and maybe teach, like teach, use it for lobster bait, I don't know. Teach people to eat green crabs. <laughs> there's a whole, uh, there's a main webpage that shows, is trying to find sources for green crabs. Yeah. Um, if we could switch to somehow making green, green crab lobster rolls iconic main <laughs> too. So what I, so what I was- <laughs> What I was getting to was uh, whether the commercial uh, mussel farms in the salt pond are affected by golden oil. And is there a conflict of uh, potential conflict of interest there? The eiders don't tend to go up where the mussel farm is. No, I mean the I golden eyes. It's, I think they have some kind of enclosure around the exclusion right. device around the mussel farm there. Oh, okay. Last time I paddled around there, most of the diving ducks were outside of it. Mm -hmm. So I think they figured something out there. Good. I thought I saw something on the chat down there. Let's see. Um, so the mill pond, the eiders don't really go much up into the mill pond. So really the, the only thing I, I was thinking for the mill pond was just that to keep uh, hunters from shooting things like the golden eyes and buffalo head, just so they don't confuse it with the barrow's golden eye. I don't think even just hunting for dabbling ducks, I don't think it's a big disturbance for the barrel's golden eyes. It's just, we wanna avoid unintentional kill up in that zone. And it's nothing about bad about the mussel farm. It might even be seeding the Blue Hill Falls area. And I thought someone was saying maybe that the Falls don't have any mussels anymore, but we think the mussel beds are down in the rapid zone, even though they disappeared from the inner tidal that you can access, because uh, the eiders are eating something in there. Um. And and if I can add to it, we had an in-person event at Ferry Landing yesterday on the green crab. And one of the things that our presenter mentioned was the fact that um, uh, green crabs have a tendency to not be as pervasive in areas with strong currents. So that might um, play into what you're saying that they would be hiding you know, down in the rapid. I see some stuff about the bridge. So both Tom and I went to one of the, at least one of the bridge meetings with the wildlife one and brought up about changing the flow regime, that that was very important or doing construction during the eiders time there. And what they're going to do is they're going to keep the, um, the base of the bridge is going to be the same. 
So there should be no change in the structure of Blue Hill Falls from what we got from them. Um, so hopefully they'll do a really good job with erosion control. We wouldn't want a lot of sediment going in there. Uh, but that's where we're at with the Blue Hill Falls uh, bridge project. So do you want me to go ahead now, uh, Jake? I'll, I can. Uh, yeah, that'd be great, David. Talk a little bit about sort of following up on uh, what Zach has been telling us. Um, I have an interest in the seaweeds that are there. And uh, let me uh, share my screen and uh, see if we can uh, see some of these photographs that I have. <clears throat> I'm trying to get the, that's what I want. Man, it doesn't seem to want to start. Let me, uh, There we go. So um, this is just by means of introduction, but what I really want to stress in, in talking about some of the seaweeds here is that the um, reversing falls area here is a very high energy area. And uh, Zach uh, alluded to it, but I think it's often uh, significant to see some of that high energy. And the high energy creates an environment that is, uh, that is uh, uh, completely different from most of the other intertidal um, areas and the coastal areas in Blue Hill Bay and in some of these uh, more uh, secluded inner bays. The, uh, the high energy, can be seen in the rapids and the outflow here. And um, in these high energy areas, it's very much like an offshore, offshore uh, cliffs and rocks where you have a lot of surf. And in those areas, we get a lot of uh, special seaweeds, such as these kelps that you see that are uh, commonly visible at the, in the low tide. Uh, in the reversing falls area on the outflow area. And I just wanna go through some of these kelps to just kind of introduce um, people who are watching to uh, the different kinds that are here. So here's some, here's some more uh, rapid flow of the, uh, of the uh, outflow from the, from the bridge area and some of the rocks uh, on the shore. This is sort of a mid-tide view. One of the uh, most uh, common of these kelps that are found in, the, uh, in these high energy areas is uh, Saccharina latissima, commonly called the sugar kelp. It's also harvested uh, for uh, its edible uh, qualities. Um, but I think that uh, one of the things that, uh, that we need to be aware of in this, in this area um, is that uh, there are a lot of unusual species of seaweeds as well as unusual species of birds. And as Zoe will tell us uh, in a little bit, unusual species of invertebrates um, that we primarily see at very low tidal and, uh, and subtidal uh, areas. Uh, and Zach uh, uh, alluded to, alluded to uh, restricting commercial harvest in these areas. And I think that we need to consider restricting collecting of uh, some of these other organisms, the seaweeds and the invertebrates, as well as in, as well as the uh, the birds, for um, this proposal that uh, Downey Sotobon is uh, putting forth. 
some of the other uh, seaweeds that we see commonly are uh, Irish moss and uh, nori or various species of porphyra. Here they are growing together on the uh, in the intertidal and uh, some uh, individual specimens seen on the uh, right hand side here. Ascophyllum is, of course, a common uh, rockweed, and it's not necessarily <laughs> restricted to high energy areas. It's pretty much present everywhere. And I just uh, wanted to show you that that's uh, present also in this, in this area. The uh, little spheres in the middle photograph and on the uh, right-hand side are the uh, reproductive receptacles that are deciduous and fall off in the uh, late spring. So you don't see them uh, typically in the summertime. There are three different kinds of uh, seaweeds. They're primarily indicated by their pigments that they have, the browns and reds and greens. Here we see an ascophyllum, which is one of the, uh, the rockweed, which is one of the uh, brown algae. And uh, associated with it, um, is a, a red uh, filamentous uh, alga called vertebrata lanosa, it used to be called polysophonia, commonly called tubed weed. And uh, it grows attached to the ascophyllum, the rockweed, and the individual specimen is shown on the right here. Some of the more unusual uh, seaweeds that we have uh, include the, the crustose um, red algae, such as Coralina officinalis or coral weed. It has calcium carbonate in its uh, cell walls and is a very, uh, very tough, uh, has a very tough nature to it. It's often found in, in tide pools. And another uh, red seaweed that you may not even recognize as a seaweed is Hildenbrandia, this uh, shiny red crust in the middle of the photograph on the, uh, on the right hand side. Another one of the brown algae that is quite unusual when you see it is, it's not unusual in that it's not uncommon, it's, it's fairly common, but it's uh, unusual when you think of it in terms of uh, what normal seaweeds seem to look like. And this is a, a um, thing called a sea potato or Leothesia deformis and uh, actually blows up into a balloon-like uh, structure as it matures. And the photograph on the right-hand side here is one that's an individual specimen that's been dried and flattened down a little bit. Well, this is sort of getting into some of what Zoe has, is planning to show us. And I just wanted to indicate that there's a lot of uh, diversity of uh, both invertebrates and seaweeds in the, uh, in the uh, intertidal. And I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and just open up uh, the, uh, open up the uh, um, discussion for uh, any questions that people may have. All right. And, and if not, I'll turn it over to Zoe for some of her uh, invertebrates. Thanks, David. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. So I, um, I'm going to be talking about the creatures that I find at low tide and just below low tide. And um, talking about these creatures and sharing them with you, I hope you're going to be thinking that's amazing. And I also am a little concerned about people going to see them in person because this area is so fragile and there's really no way to walk at low tide without harming and likely killing a lot of these very, very tiny animals. So 
and I'm a very, very tiny person. I weigh 100 pounds. I, I go on tiptoe, and I, I still know I'm causing harm to be sharing these photos with you. Um, so if you do want to go, just be careful. And probably the safest way to explore is snorkeling, um, because then you're not stepping on these creatures. I am also not a scientist, although having observed there for some time, I'm going to share some things which may seem counterintuitive to things we've already heard today. Um, and I don't, I, all I'm going to do is share my observations. So when I get there, the first animals that I normally see are the anemones. And in this case, the northern serianthids or the burrowing anemones. And at low tide, many of them are exposed like this and their tentacles just um, fold up in this way. But if you, um, look at them underwater, then they look like these beautiful mandalas when their tentacles come out. Now, these are not the only uh, anemones in the area. So I believe that these are frilled anemones and sometimes they'll be hanging from rocks. They attach themselves to substrates. The one on the top right is attached to a tiny little piece of mussel shell that's attached to a sea urchin. So they can be very small and, you know, I don't know what happens when that, um, when that muscle um, is released from that sea urchin. And when they're disturbed, then they close up their tentacles like the one on the bottom right. So there's been discussion about um, the green crabs. And when I first started going to explore this area about six or seven years ago, the whole low tide area was covered in sea stars and, and mussels. And then some people began collecting these sea stars and selling them to biological supply companies. So while the sea stars may be recovering in the water, you still don't see them on the shore. Um, I am seeing a lot of mussels in the water, although not yet on the shore much as well. And so there's discussion about the green crabs. And when I was snorkeling this past weekend, I saw tons of green crabs in the fast moving current. And I also saw tons of um, mussels. So um, the theory that the green crabs are destroying the mussels may or may not be an idea. I wish was green crab. But I also saw the sea star eating. Um, if, if sea stars are preying on green crabs, that is a good thing. And so like David, I feel like it's really important that whatever we try to do to create a sanctuary in this area, it protects not only the birds, but also protects from the collecting of animals in this very amazing and fragile ecosystem. So here are more um, sea stars. And even though there are a lot of different colored sea stars in this montage of photos, all but one are um, one of two different species. So there are Forbes sea stars and there are uh, Northern sea stars. And the way you can tell them apart is by the madreporite, which is that little disc that you see on the top. So <clears throat> the Forbes have a um, bright orange madreporite and the Northern have a pale yellow madreporite. And the madreporite is how the sea star controls the flow of water into their bodies. Now, the one that doesn't belong is the one on the bottom right. That's a blood star. I took that photo in Acadia, but all these other ones, I took them within a half an hour, the photos of them underwater at Blue Hill Falls. And this is just a close up picture of <laughs> the madreporite on a Forbes sea star. So um, not all of the sea stars are, one, are, are either Forbes or Northern. They're also brittle stars, but they're much rarer there. Uh, they're hard to find and um, they move in an entirely different way. And I set the movement to music and I'm gonna share that with you now. It's all right with me 
Okay, sorry for the abrupt ending to that. Um, so they move in this incredibly cool way. They're also incredibly fragile. So if you were to try and pick one up, there's a really good chance you one of their legs would um, break off. Now they would regrow that leg, but um, best to leave them undisturbed. So related to sea stars and sea urchins and sand dollars are sea cucumbers. And that's what these pictures are of. Although you can see uh, in the photo on the left, on the top, you can see um, that there's a brittle star that's hanging out on that sea cucumber. And the photo on the right, that's a little sea cucumber and that's a 12 scaled worm um, that's in the foreground of that picture. Now here's a sea cucumber. Um, with their legs out, and uh, that's how they feed. And um, I learned recently that their mouth and their anus are the same um, hole. And so that just made me feel really glad not to be a sea cucumber. So these are my favorite uh, animals at the Blue Hill Falls area. These are nudibranchs. And this is a pellucid, these are both pellucid aeolus, and these are the ones I see most commonly. Um, I just think they're so stunningly beautiful. They're, they're quite small. Um, these mm, seem to max out at around one inch long, but in the spring, they're teeny tiny. So in the photo on the left, that is an Arctic lyre crab, and you can see two tiny little nudibranchs on the sort of top and either side of that crab. And in the photo on the right, that is my pinky finger next to a baby nudibranch. And at low tide, sometimes um, I'll find them in shells like this periwinkle shell on the left or this mussel shell on the right. So um, the pellucid aeolus aren't the only kind of nudibranchs that are at Blue Hill Falls. So the top left, that is a robust frond aeolus and um, the bottom left and the right, those are color variations on the red fingered aeolus, I believe. And then the one in the middle, I believe is a salmon aeolus. And again, all found in this area. And um, this is a robust frond aeolus laying eggs in the current. And I don't know how these eggs are going to make it because normally when I see the eggs, they are attached to um, a rock or some sort of substrate. Um, so I don't know what was gonna happen to those eggs. So um, the nudibranchs like to eat tubularian hydroids, which is another kind of animal. And in the spring, I often see them in abundance, like the photo on the left. And the photo on the right is just a close-up of them. And um, these are just one kind of hydroid. There's also this kind of hydroid, which is Hydractinia echinata, which is called snail fur. And sometimes if you see a hermit crab like this one that looks orange or rust colored. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's animals living on the shell of that hermit crab, what's called snail fur. And I have read that um, there may be a protective quality for the um, hermit crabs because there's tiny stinging cells in those hydroids. So we talked a little bit about mussels. While I don't see mussels on the shore anymore, I, I am seeing lots and lots of mussels under the water. And when we see mussels on the shore, it's usually closed up. Um, and so we don't get to see these beautiful, um, how beautiful mussels are when they open up. So I took this photo this past weekend while I was snorkeling and um, you can see that mussel just feeding and open. Now you might be saying to yourself, why did Zoe put that photo into this slideshow? Because that looks like a glob of something really gross. Um, but actually this is about a dozen animals. They're skeleton shrimp in this, um, in this photo. And I'm gonna show you this little video of a skeleton shrimp moving at low tide. Now these are tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, they're about a quarter of an inch. You can see in the background too, there's some movement. That's more skeleton shrimp. And uh, there's a little photo bomb at the bottom left of a, of a um, nudibranch. And these are just incredible uh, creatures 
that are really um once you notice them you notice them all over because of the movement even though they're so tiny of course you're hearing the falls in the background so this is another favorite creature but that's probably because i've never been bitten by one of them these are clam worms or this is a clam worm i have heard they inflict a, a very nasty bite but as i said never been bitten but they certainly are beautiful you don't see them out of their holes very often they do sometimes come out and um, then if there's any disturbance they'll they'll slink back into their holes which is kind of cool to watch so this beautiful animal is a sea vase or a solitary tunicate and they have these gorgeous hot yellow rims around their mouths um, and as beautiful as they are um, they are considered invasives like many of the tunicates there's a club tunicate on the right another invasive um, so their latin name is i hope i'm pronouncing this right siona intestinalis which literally means pillars of intestines and you can see why. So through their translucent bodies, you can see their intestines, which is kind of cool. Um, but again, they are considered invasives and sometimes you see them in abundance like this. I took this picture um, again snorkeling last weekend. So um, this is bryozoa. This is another animal. I know it doesn't look like an animal, but um, bryozoa, this kind is otherwise called sea lace and they make these beautiful geometric shapes and the photo on the right that is sea lace that is covering a piece of kelp and now i'm going to go back to the tunicate so this beautiful um, colonial tunicate is an orange sheath tunicate and they come in a variety of colors orange and rust and blood red and yellow and they really are quite beautiful um, and they are considered invasives as well. And in this case, this orange sheath tunicate is not only covering um, this rock, but is also covering the sea vase, the solitary tunicate. So it's sort of invading another invasive. And then the last kind of um, tunicate that I see regularly um, at Blue Hill Falls is the star tunicate. I took these photos this past weekend. Um, so the photo on the left is just a close up of the photo on the right. And um, some of these uh, creatures, these tunicates get um, names like um, pancake batter or um, names like um, marine vomit, uh, which lets you know how people really feel about them. So um, uh, I just wanted to share that just to reiterate that I, I feel so strongly that we have to be so careful when we go and visit these places that we're not causing harm. And so I put this slide up about the Institute for Humane Education, which, which is the organization that I co-founded. And our mission statement there lets you know why I feel so strongly about this. And if any of you are interested in learning about what we do at the Institute, feel free to email me or visit our website. So I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there are any questions. Thank you all so much. That was a wonderful connected team effort. Um, it was so educational as well. Let's see, we do have a couple of new questions. Um, first, there was some compliments of the beautiful imagery that was presented this afternoon. So thank you guys for that. I think that there was, I don't know if we covered this and forgive me if we already did, but um, David, there's a question for you about what biomass is of Flana in the falls. And then- Yeah, I- uh, You actually answered that, perfect. Yeah, I answered it. I'm, I'm really not familiar, nor do I know of any studies that have indicated biomass of the, uh, um, seaweeds or uh, organisms in general in that area. But I did suggest that it was probably not that much more than some of the uh, rich shorelines that are covered with rockweed, although there's not as much diversity in those. Zoe might have an idea since she's the one snorkeling and stuff compared to other areas. <laughs> um, 
Well, I, I don't know the biomass. All I can say is the biodiversity is right. like nowhere else I have ever, ever seen. Yeah. Cool. Around does here, seem, anyway. Does it seem like the weeds or the seaweeds thicker there than if you snorkel other places? Um, that, like more of the rocks are covered and there's just more. Well, it, it, the other the other shorelines are very densely covered with rockweed, but it's kind of a monoculture. Uh, not not really. There are a lot of things in the rockweed forest, so it's different. It's as so said. It's a it's the diversity of uh, different seaweeds that are there, right? And I think it argues uh, very well for your proposal to uh, somehow create a preserved area that there's no hunting and that there's, as Zoe mentioned, that there's no collecting, right? I know uh, Nick Constantinople had uh, a question to Zoe uh, about uh, scuba diving or, or snorkeling in the area. I don't think uh, Zoe typically snorkels when the, when the outflow is as strong as I showed in some of my slides, but would you speak to that? So, <laughs> sure. Well, I, I definitely don't snorkel um, in the area under the bridge where um, I'm snorkeling to the left of that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to say that when I snorkeled this weekend, the current was really intense. And um, so, you know, you want to snorkel in the areas where it's calmer um, because you don't want to get caught in, you know, uh, and pulled out into that um, rough water. There was also a question, um, is the green crab the villain of the falls? <laughs> can, I, can I just say that um, if the green crab is the villain of the falls, uh, I think there, there may be a number of villains. Um, <laughs> and I would say that even though I'm seeing a lot of these invasive tunicates um, and invasive sponges that appear, they tend to appear late summer and early fall, and then they're gone in the spring. And, um, and so I've been worried at different times. I've gone and I've seen no hydroids and no nudibranchs and really worried, but in the spring, they're back again. And so there has been a cycle. Um, I can say that it seems like the primary reason that the sea stars were decimated was because of collectors, not because of something that was happening um, uh, due to non-human animals. And so with the green crabs, for me, the jury's out in terms of how much of an impact they're having there because I'm seeing a year after year after year, incredible biodiversity there, um, despite the green crabs. And um, and I, I would love to see what happened if we stopped collecting. And, and I don't know about the mussels. I mean, I am seeing more, but uh, as I said, I'm not a scientist, I'm just an observer. I thought I had heard something about a sea star disease too that came through. Right. But. So there was a, a question. I'm, I don't mean to take away uh, Jake's uh, 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 leadership here, but there was a question that Ann asked about how to move this proposal forward. And uh, Zach, if you could, uh, uh, with your committee that's been set up, uh, uh, address that point. I think that's one of the main things that we want to have as a takeaway from this uh, webinar. Yeah, so mostly we just want to get the word out, get people talking about it. Um, Tom's been really helpful in that and getting to the people that are the people that need to be talked to, especially people on the other side. We don't want to seem like we're environmentalists that are trying to go over the top of other people with differing views. We're trying to get in touch with people like Ducks Unlimited that's conservation oriented, but maybe they are also interested in the same stuff we are. Um, and then hopefully if we can show that we have a broad enough co coalition locally that we can persuade a legislator to do something. Because um, since it's the ocean, you have to, you have to go through the state or federally. Um, and I think it'd be a neat precedent to have some saltwater habitat preserved 
and not in the, the common utilization that you see in other areas. But, so um, yeah, write, write, write your local legislators, tell them you're interested in this, um, talk with people and try to, you know, see what concerns they might have or if they're enthusiastic. Um, Are there any comparable programs in other places along this coast or other coast funds? Yeah, the, the precedent I was going off of in the regs for duck hunting, the one we saw that is actually listed is Mary Meeting Bay. So we tried to mm -hmm. figure out how they got Mary Meeting Bay passed. And then we <laughs> finally found out that um, I think it was someone that maybe that I forgot how they were connected, but it was something about shooting and near their house or something. I thought it's what they found out is what it took for them to preserve an area for sea ducks or mm. more like estuary and ducks. Right. Um, uh, I've heard a lot from fish, main fish and wildlife that they don't like re regulations to be too cumbersome. So they don't like lots of sanctuaries. Um, I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think it's going to be an easy process, but to get someone to actually put it forward and get a vote on it, have it, you'll notice a lot of the sanctuaries that do exist have very old wording. So I'm not sure when the last one was proposed. And most, almost all of them are on land, which I mean, at least on land, you have private areas that can act as refuges to people's private land where wildlife can go. Uh, I guess it's unfortunate that the precedent for for this is the uh, 17th century fishing, fowling, and uh, navigation uh, law that uh, allows for those activities in the uh, inner time. Yeah, so that's the hard part, making this, this would be almost a new precedent. Yeah. Um, and sometimes new stuff can, it, it's kind of hard to get that ball rolling. Well, I think this is a great start and I, I've certainly learned a lot and I enjoyed all, all of your contributions to this collaborative um, outreach that we've done here today. Uh, we do have a couple minutes left. I, I sort of forgot, but Beth, did, did anybody raise their hand? Did anyone want to ask any of our presenters their question with their own audio? Uh, no one has raised their hand. We've uh, gotten a couple of questions um, in the chat most of them have been addressed. Um, one uh, that was just recently asked is, are there any um, controls anywhere on collecting? So I'm assuming that's for all species, mussels and sea stars and everything else. I'm not familiar with that. So are you? No, I'm not. So there was a, um, oh, Zoe, that was you. You submitted that. That's great. Perfect. Maybe we can include that in the, um, in the follow-up email, Beth, what Zoe just okay. submitted. So to get the word out there for folks on for September 8th. Um, and I agree with Anne that it would be so great to hold a stakeholder meeting and uh, get more people involved. And um, Zach, I so appreciate your leadership around this sanctuary. And yeah. um, I think that would be really wonderful. Thank you, Anne. So I'm coming maybe, through our questions. Maybe, Zach, maybe you could put that in, Jake, maybe you could put that in a follow-up as well, in a follow-up email, if, uh, if Zach would agree to kind of uh, um, coordinate. You just, to, yeah, you just have to wait for the summer rush to be over, you know, maybe by like mid-September. Yeah, that's fun. Yep. Uh, if you guys are if you guys are comfortable, we can list all of your um, contacts so that people can reach out to you for you know different reasons. That's uh, okay. Great, great. As long as everyone's comfortable with that, then we have some some places for people to field their questions to and um, ask how they can help and and be a part of the positive solution to this. Uh, so I have. Five o'clock. We don't have to end right abruptly. If there's anything left that any of um, Zach, David,
David, so if there's anything, any final party pieces you wanted to put out there, we can make a couple of minutes for it. <laughs> no, that's all right. Well, thank you all so much. And Beth, thanks so much, obviously, for standing in for Lander. It's, it's wonderful to have both of our um, land trusts represented in this great effort. So. Excellent. And just to let everyone know, too, I will try to get the recording of this up within the next couple of days. And if anyone would like to, any of the panelists would like to uh, provide us with any links to information that you feel would be pertinent to what you've discussed today, I'd be happy to include those in um, the area below in the description for this video. Thanks, Beth. And thank thanks you. for coming, everyone. All right, everyone, have a great evening. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.